All right. I think uh, I think we have everyone, Andy, and uh, there'll be a few people that will be joining us. So uh, perhaps we'll just uh, we'll get started. Um, so good early morning, Australia, and uh, good afternoon to those of you joining us from the U.S. and Canada, and good evening to all of our participants from across Europe. Uh, I'm David Phillips, Learning and Development Consultant and Sessional Lecturer at La Trobe University here in Melbourne, and uh, the former National Coach Development Manager for Tennis Australia. Welcome to our webinar series on leadership. During these exceptional times, we want to add as much value to you and your business as possible so that you just don't suffer through this global event, but instead maximize your opportunities while providing inspired leadership to our community. Our intention is to connect, share, and support to manifest a strong sense of hopefulness and belonging. And to do this, that we've gathered key industry leaders from around the world to share their insights and real-time advice on what sport leaders can do right now. We appreciate you prioritizing the time to connect with us today. Today's topic is caring for our members, how to maintain and manage your community in a disconnected time. And we're joined today by my good friend and colleague, Andy Sutton. Good afternoon, Andy. Evening, David. Good to see you. <laughs> good to see you, mate. Um, for those of you that are outside of Canada and less familiar with Andy, just a few career highlights. Um, Andy, Andy holds both a high performance coach three and a master club professional uh, three qualification from Tennis Canada. He's an expert in coaching, coach development, facility management, program and curriculum design. He has a diverse background as a head tennis pro and tennis director in community, private and commercial environments. Andy is currently the tennis director at Unionville Tennis Club, the assistant head pro at the Donalda Club, the head coach developer for Tennis Canada in the province of Ontario, and he also serves on the board of the Philpott Foundation, which is a charity organization in Toronto. Um, I don't know how he manages to keep all those things in order. Uh, he's a busy guy. Um, and uh, off the court, uh, Andy's married to uh, his wife, Kathy, and he's got two gorgeous children, Megan and Liam. Um, before we get stuck into the heart of the timely discussion today with Andy, just a few details about the webinar structure. Um, should you leave the webinar early, there will be a cloud recording that's available and a follow-up email, so you'll be able to watch it uh, at your own leisure at another point in time. Um, we're probably going to spend about uh, 30 to 40 minutes in conversation with Andy discussing the issues and then that will be followed up by, you know, five to 10 minutes of questions from the audience. Um, you can use the chat feature, which is located in the bottom toolbar um, of the webinar. And if you happen to ask something as we go along the way, we'll try and answer questions in real time as well. Um, so pretty excited to kick off today's webinar with my uh, colleague and really good friend who is joining us from uh, Toronto in Ontario, Canada this morning. Um, how's life there, Andy? How's the weather? What's going on? Well, the weather is actually, you know, had we not had what's going on, uh, it was looking like we we're going to have an early, early start to the season. Um, the weather's pretty good. It's, it's sunny. It's nice outside actually right now. Um, you know, it's comfortable temperature, probably 12, 13 degrees. Um, overall, it's good. The, the situation in the province, however, is different. Um, clubs are closed. Uh, pretty much every facility in Ontario is closed. Outdoor facilities are in a situation where they've mandated that they need to stay closed for the foreseeable future. Um, there's no tennis operations of any kind. In fact, for people, for, for clubs that have um, bubbles, getting the bubble down on time actually is probably going to be a concern. So it, it's, mm. uh, it, everything's at a standstill. Everything's on a bit of a standstill. I, I have to say, I, um, there are lots that I miss about Canada, but I certainly don't miss that moment when you have to uh, rally the troops to bring the bubble down or rally the troops to get the bubble up again. But always happy to see a change of scenery and a change of season. That's always a great thing. Um, and, and how are you? Uh, I know the kids are back home um, um, from school and from university. Um, how's life in the house with, uh, with a full deck? Fortunately, it's uh, my kids being older. Um, my daughter, she's in first year university. So she still has studies. They've moved everything online. Um, so she's, you know, she, she's got enough to keep her busy during the day. And then, you know, once she's finished studying, uh, you know, getting ready for exams and so on, 
then she's communicating with her friends, they're FaceTiming, they're doing, you know, those different things. Uh, my son is 16, so he's in grade 11, finishing grade 11. Uh, so I don't have that kind of um, thing that all my neighbors have who have much younger children of trying to keep them busy. You know, they're pretty good at keeping themselves busy. So, so on our end, it's, it's, it's not too bad. There's enough space that everyone's doing their work in their different quadrants of the house. So, uh, you know, on, all in all, it, it could be a lot worse. Mm. Now, I mean, it, given the variety of environments you work in, some of those environments have natural offices. I'm sure like most tennis pros, you're used to working a bit from home. Um, how are you managing not being on the court and just being housebound and deskbound at the moment? What's your daily life look like these days? Um, surprisingly well. I mean, it, it's funny. I didn't think I'm, I'm typically an early riser, um, but I don't have to get up as early as I used to. But I find I actually kind of miss having I miss having things to do. But it, it's it, given the breadth of things that I tend to do, like, you know, I, I tend to keep pretty busy. Um, the only difference is what's missing. There's there's always a part of my day where, you know, I have office work to do. Um, it's just, there's more of it now. So I have more time to get that done. Um, and so what's, you know, missing is the on-court component that's been filled up with some, you know, the honey do list a little bit. There's some of those sort of mm -hmm. projects that are happening, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's not, I just have more of my, you know, my, my computer time at this time of year. Um, this would actually be very much like what would be happening now because we're, we're almost in the transition between indoor and outdoor for the, for bubbled locations. So, clubs would normally be kind of not just yet maybe a week from now on hiatus while they take the bubble down make the transition to outdoor courts so this is actually kind of normal what's going to be very different is going forward because it looks like we're going to be off the court my suspicion is if we're lucky sometime in may we might get on the court but i don't even know if that's realistic mm. and in in canada is there a is there an overall national approach to the return to tennis or is each province each area dealing with tennis and tennis activity differently uh at the moment i would say overall nationally I, i'm well let me start my answer again i think it's going to very much depend on where you are right now in, in for example in british columbia there they've been able to sort of manage this issue in a way uh, unlike anywhere else in the country their numbers are much lower so but again i don't know if that's going to mean they're going to have the opportunity to return you know to, to to group environments any sooner than anybody else the threat it seems is that everyone kind of needs to we need to knock this down to a level where there'll be, there'll be you know flare-ups here and there but everyone's kind of got to do their part so i wouldn't say there's a national strategy although i think it's going to be relatively similar throughout the country mm -hmm. i appreciate those insights um uh, probably one of the reasons you and i caught up a uh, it had been a long overdue catch up, but we caught up a few weeks ago to chat about today's topic. And one of the things when I was thinking brainstorming around today's topic, um, you came front of mind to me just as the person, you know, I'd love to have a catch up with and to share your insights is you've had such a incredibly diverse background between community tennis, which is really just summer tennis run by volunteers to commercial tennis clubs, which you know are privately owned um, and have a very different operating model. But you've also been in the private club um, environment, which is still a membership base, but uh, a quite a different beast. Um, so can you just talk us through a little bit of like, what are, what are some of the important features of member clubs and membership from, from, your, from your variety of background? Um. Member clubs, at least specifically the, the um, hang on one second, this isn't cooperating. Space bar, tab bar, there we yeah. go. <laughs> it, was, it was, I guess it had decided. Technology is a work in, for a work in progress. <laughs> um, the, the biggest difference as far as member clubs go in terms of, especially in terms of the private club arena, um, very much so, you know, in Canada, but a lot in the Toronto area, um, is members who join clubs of this nature are members for a long time. You don't have much turnover, you know, um, members, 
the average in a commercial club, the average lifespan of a member is over seven years. Uh, I don't have exact figures for what it is for a, a, a private club, but I would suspect it's, it's you know, much longer than that. The only real reasons people leave clubs, uh, a private club, is they're moving, work has changed, or, you know, they generally, they age out, essentially. They become injured or incapable of utilizing the facility in a way that, that makes sense. Um, you know, that's one of the things. The other thing is clubs of this nature, part of the reason why the turnover is so low is it's expensive. You know, if you, to join some of the private clubs in the city, you could, for a family, have to pay between thirty to $50,000 to, you know, just to get access. And then your fees are on top of that. So when people join these kind of clubs, it's, it's an investment in their lifestyle. They don't, they, you know, the club, it becomes a place where the family goes. It becomes, you know, depending on where the club is situated, especially say somewhere like, I'll use an example, the Toronto Lawn, which is in a community, you know, kids kind of go to the club on their own. Their parents come over at different times. It's a second home. It's a place where, you know, the, the whole family goes and they, you know, they, they exist doing different things at different times and they kind of congregate and, you know, meet up as a family, but it's very much a second home to people. So that's one of the bigger differences compared to a seasonal mm -hmm. club. Yeah, no, I would, I would sense that, um, um, I would sense that there's a bit, you know, as much as we all feel a sense of loss of our individual freedoms at the moment, um, that in these sorts of environments where the club is your second home, like many of us, you know, our gym might be our second home. We either go there first thing in the morning or at the end of the day. Um, and those connections that this is particularly challenging in those moments. Um, but this second home thing and these high expectations probably comes along with um, a different kind of tennis professional or a different kind of staff that takes care of these members. So, um, can you give us a little bit of a background as to, um, you know, the profile of staff members and, um, and some of their, you know, their characteristics? Uh, I would say, at, especially at the private clubs, the private club is because compensation is, is you know, is pretty good. Um, they generally attract coaches who are well certified. Uh, and once you have this kind of job, it, you tend to stay in this job for quite a long time. I mean, the only real reason to move would be to move up. You know, if, if you were a staff pro and you then had the opportunity to take a more leadership position, that might be a reason to leave. But otherwise, it, it kind of like it, it's a, you know, it's a home for the members. It's kind of a home for the pro. Um, the staff are there a long time. And because they have the ability to, to usually get better staff, you know, more qualified, more capable staff, um, the environment that pros work in is, is really, you know, it, it's usually very, it's, it's very, it's a very good environment. You know, you're working with peers. Um, you're able to, to enjoy what you do in a way that maybe you don't if you're working with people where people are more transient, you know, you develop kind of more of a family. So it, it's really good. Another thing is yeah. because of, the, of it, if you look at the, you know, the clubs in the city, uh, and I'll use Toronto as an example because it's what I know best. The people who um, are in the positions tend to, to grow. And once you sort of get into that private world, as I said, generally, if you're going to move, you move up. You know, you, you stay and you might grow responsibilities within your club. But then eventually you become big enough that maybe you're able to move to another club and take on a bigger role. So the potential for growth, both internal to the club and external in the industry, is is something that's very attractive, I think, to, to the you know pros who really want to make a, a mark in the industry and, and sort of a, a long term career. Mm. And I think there's certainly uh, having had experience in two of the three um, community and uh, commercial, there is uh, there's certainly a real difference in terms of. Um, the lack of, you know, community clubs can have a very transient population or a population that you might only see every summer and then they disappear for the winter time, either to a private club environment or they just don't play tennis. Um, and, uh, and that's a very different thing than seeing members 
day in, day out, year round, where they, unless they're going off skiing for a few weeks, they, they are essentially at the club, except for possibly during their holiday times. Um, your, your approach to these environments, um, to, to coaching, but also to managing teams, um, can you just give us a little, uh, describe that, give us a bit of background on that? Um, one of the things that is sort of central to what I believe, um, is that, and, and it, it, it's the same actually for members and staff, but you need to look after the person before I worry about trying to teach somebody something. The, the job we are in or the position we're in is we're essentially trying to change behavior. If we're, let's say, then we're speaking more about the role on court right now. My job is to convince somebody to do a thing in a different way than they have been doing it. Where, especially if it's a, you know, the kind of typical private club or commercial club member who's been playing tennis for a long time, they've got habits. They do things in a certain way. And to make changes, I have to convince them that it's a better way to go and show them that this is going to lead them to their goals. But if I try to impose that by just saying, well, this technique or this tactic or whatever it is, is better. If I don't address who the person is and, and what resonates with them and, you know, make them have a trust, uh, primarily a trust with me, then I, I don't get very far or if we don't, we don't, pro we don't progress. So if you look after the person, it opens the door to doing all those other things, you know, so along mm. with that, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. I just, uh, it's, we are in such a, you know, we have all these methodologies, you know, are very coach centered. Then we're very player centered, very person centered, all that rhetoric around, you know, you know, the, they won't do anything until they know how much you care about them. There's a lot of jargon out there. Um, but that, that really simplistic notion of putting people first um, before you engage with what the issue is or what the thing is that you want to do. It's simple, but it's, 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 it's strong. It's powerful. It's very effective. And it's something I've seen you over time actually bring to life. You walk the talk. I, I, I mean, I, it, it's, it's funny. I, I, uh, I know it's sort of the way I've done things, but it wasn't till I don't know, relatively recently that I, I could have described it this way. You know, it just sort of made sense that that's sort of what you do is, is our, our industry is a, it's a, you know, you've, you've got to, you've got to like, well, I don't say you have to like the people you work with, but it's certainly, I believe better because I, I look forward to going to work. I, I miss, I miss the people that, you know, that I normally work with and I miss them as people. And so, you know, I, I find myself compelled to reach out, you know, call, send an email, send a text, just sort of check in because I miss the people you know, and if the, it, it's a relationship, you know, that's really what it is. We, we have a relationship and it's, it's, it's greater than just the tennis side of things. And so, you know, mm. now maybe after having thought it through, I can articulate it better, but that's, yeah, I, I you know, that's really where it comes from. Mm. How do you take this professional approach? What's your team culture like? What's your staff like, your team? Um, How do you bring that to life? The first thing, well, I've, I've been fortunate to have some good mentors to work with. Um, and the thing that I've tried to embody, you know, from what I've learned is they, or my, the staff that I work with needs to know that I've got their back. You know what I mean? That, that I'm prepared to give to them everything that I can to make them succeed. Like my, my long-term goal for all of my team is that at some point they will surpass the ability that I have to, to work, to work, well, not work with them, but they'll get to a point where the jobs that I have available, uh, they need a bigger role. You know what I mean? I'd like them to grow past mm -hmm. the opportunities that I can provide. Now, if, you know, if I can provide a bigger role, then I would love to do it. But I, I want them to be, you know, leaders in their own right. At some point, I want to look at them as people, you know, I, I'm, old, I'm older than most of my team. Um, but I want to be able to look at them as equals so that, you know, they become the tennis director somewhere. That's, that's 
that's what I want for them. So in order to do that, you know, we run professional development sessions and, and typically the way those go, there's, there's sort of two frameworks that, that operate in terms of that. There's the on court stuff, which is obvious. And, and typically I just sort of ask them, you know, what is it that you struggle with? And then, then we, you know, we kind of go to work and we try to, you know, make sure if, if we can, after doing something, make them feel that they're more capable at doing what they do on a daily basis, then, then we're succeeding, you know, because, because the, we all know that there's parts of the job that are more fun and parts of the job that are a little bit more, almost if you could call them work. But if you can make it so that you're skillful, then you move those things that were work into the category of being fun. So we can do that. But then at the same time, we look to develop people in an off court capacity as well, just develop them as people, you know, because so I'll give an example of a coach. Um, they want to, you know, their goal was to, um, you know, try to develop some online resources, but they, they needed help with the business side. Now, I, you know, I can offer what I know, but then it became important that we sort of sat down and did some, some goal setting around, you know, well, if this is what you want to do, then here's the information you need. And probably here's where you should go to get it. And, you know, looking after them in that way so that they can, you know, reach their, reach what they want, reach their dreams, make their goals. It, it's, it's, you know, again, if, if I, if I worry about improving the overall person, I think then, you know, we get, we get them where they want to get to. And, then they trust me and, and we work better together. Well, I, I mean, I certainly think that uh, if uh, it's a bit trite to say this, but um, if you want your team to invest in their role in the members and in their care for their profession and for the club environment, um, at some point in time, you have to model that with your care for them and hope that it translates. Um, and I've certainly seen you do that over the years. Um, with respect to your team, how do you see um, how do you see their role with members? You know, just bef before we got into this moment, can you maybe give us a little bit of a background about you know what your approach has been, what their approach has been, um, what does that interaction look like? So, uh, sorry, with 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 my team or with members? Uh, yeah, your team's role in dealing with members. Oh, um, the things that I really try to get my team to do is, I mean, obviously, again, they need to be competent and skillful on court. That's, that's a given because of the nature of what we do, but we know that you, you're going to do better. And again, it's easier to get people to follow if you are clear with them and they're clear with you in terms of what their goals are. So my team needs to make sure that they, spend some time to really understand what it is that the member they're dealing with at that time wants and needs. So in a private setting, it's just, they've got to, you know, take some time to listen to the member, you know, make sure they're clear. They ask the right questions. They ask good questions so that they get a good sense of how to proceed. You know, that's the first thing in a group setting. It's a little different. Sometimes you might have to make some um, assumptions, and, you know, you can often kind of know, but that's, that's one of the main things. The other thing is we want to try to deal with our members in a, in a kind of a holistic way. And so to address their needs and concerns, we have to make sure we know what those things are, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the on-court role. Now we're really kind of in the, a zone where we're mostly just communicating with our members, either by phone or email, text, whatever it happens to be. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. And so with this uncertainty now, it's about making sure that they can answer the questions that members have, because members have a lot of questions, you know, there's, that's kind of where things are a little bit, but if they don't have the answers right away, then they are going to point them to where they can find the answers, or they're going to go get those answers for the member and report back, but they can't leave people, um, you know, hanging. They have to make sure that, you know, people are, are looked after. And it, it's with, with the nature of being as disconnected as things are, it's, it just, it just, it's, it's important. I believe it's really important that we're, 
if we can be, you know, one less question or one less thing that, that people have concerns about, that's helpful. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree. And, and there is nothing worse than, you know, whether either you or your team gets on the phone with someone and you just don't have the right information um, mm. and or if that information isn't available that you aren't able to communicate with confidence about when that decision will be made or when the information will be available. I think that's, that's so key to, uh, you know, reducing anxiety and increasing confidence and ultimate that ultimately that's what it's about is making people feel skillful and making pe people feel well taken care of. Um, I totally agree. And, and, and just as a part of a normal, um, part of, uh, of how you manage your members, um, what would normally be, you know, what would normally be the approach your team would take in terms of customer service and membership management? And this might be a generalization across the different environments, or it might be something that you approach holistically. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, well, I mean, I'll, I'll just kind of give the title of the slide that's up, but, but understand your role. You need to know how you fit in, in terms of the members tennis life and their life in general you know if, if you understand this because what what we it's easy to forget that we're central to people's leisure time you know like it's it's one of the greatest things about the industry that we're in is when people are looking to be happy we're the people they're coming to see so mm -hmm. it, you need to kind of really understand that and so that helps you remember that you know you you may when me well, I'm, I'm an odd person in the sense that I don't have bad days very often, but you don't want to have, you can't have really have a bad day. You know, you, you, you need to be happy. And the thing is it's because the members coming in, they're happy and typically you're happy. Like you, you, you create kind of this sort of synergistic thing and, and yeah, it's better. Like you, you create a good environment, but you have to really remember that and respect the importance of it. Um, you know, and then as, aside from that, I, I'm sure as to the audience as we're speaking, I'm sure you can think of a time where a member has arrived for a lesson and, you know, they were able to do something, whatever this thing was. And, you know, you start in and, you know, you're going to continue working on it and they're, they're not, they're not, they're not performing where they should, you know, and, and you can see like they've rushed on the court, they've come rushing in, their mind is obviously someplace else because, you know, work or life or whatever is intruding on the moment that you're in. And, you know, it, it pays dividends to take some time, check in with where they are, you know, find a way to get them into that zone where they can be where they need to be and put those things aside. And, you know, it, it's something that you just sort of really need to do. So you, your role is really important in what they do. And if you know that, then it's easier for you to make sure that you satisfy the needs of the clients. You, you offer much better customer service. But again, if you're not, hopefully it's not you're thinking of, it, of them as customers. It's just, it's what you do because you care about the people. Mm. I would agree, which is, uh, that goes back to that conversation. I remember from years and years and years ago, we were all in it with uh, one of our mentors, or both of our mentors, Louis Caillé, that whole conversation around who you are comes, which one's first, who you are, what you know, what you do. But that notion that it's hard to change who people are. So you really want to attract people to the team that share that philosophy, share that, uh, share that approach, that mm. people approach. So do you have practical things that the team does to maintain connection? Um, well, uh, you know, at, at some of the private clubs, the, what we do is we make sure to send, you know, we try to get the, the team because it's, you know, everyone's busy. They don't have a lot of time. So we kind of have a, a sit down session or we get everyone together and we, you know, come up with, a year's worth of tips, 12 tips. And you just, you know, you make a sort of a schedule and at the beginning of the month or whenever it is that you do, you send your tip to your entire base and you just email it to everybody, make it easy on you. But it's the responses you get back, especially when you first start to do this, it's surprising because it, it, the, the member who receives this almost feels as though you're speaking specifically to them. You know, and so 
it's just it's just to keep them connected make them know that you're thinking about them you know make them feel appreciated and important and then the other thing is one of the other things is to understand that your role with the player doesn't end when the session time you have with them ends so you know if people are playing I'll, if I can or if the team can you spend some time watching it it could be that you're having a lesson beside them you know and that's what it is but you watch over and you just kind of keep track and so then you you know you mention to them oh you know I was watching you play and you know you were playing all the time up the middle or to the player's forehand you know if you if you hit more balls to their weakness you know maybe you're going to do a little bit better especially against this person or things like that because again it, it just shows that you they mean more to you than just the, the moment that you're booked to spend with them, right? One of the other things that we do is we try to send, you know, send a handwritten note to somebody. The, the, the one that stands out in my mind is I was working with a, a you know, a young player. He's, he's pretty good. He's eight, you know, and he has the potential to, you know, to be something. He's, he's a high, he's on the high performance track. And, you know, he, he played as he played, a tournament and did really well and I just I just sent him a note to say that I, you know I thought this was really good and for the next few sessions he was just so much more invested you know because it, it just it spoke to him and it was it was a powerful message so in the world we're in today where it's so easy to send a text or send an email to take the time to just write something down put it in the mail and have it arrive really just it's it says something to people and and you know it's it's when you get birthday cards in the mail, you know, you're happy because someone thought of you, they thought to take the time to make that happen. It's the same thing. And then finally, when you have time or when, when there's, you know, you need to convey something that isn't short and simple, get on the phone and call people. You know, I, I know in a lot of coaches, this is what they do, especially if you're a high performance coach, you have to have post-match, um, you know, analysis or, you know, to speak to your player, to get a sense of where they were and, you know, what happened and, debrief and it's rare that you'll you typically don't do that you know electronically you do that in person because there's an exchange well this is the same all the time for whether your member is a high performance member or or a rec player that exchange is important so every now and again you know you just need to check in with people and so get on the phone and talk to them yeah i think it's a it's such a great habit i've seen you you know embody um, over the years, um, and it's a challenging one, but it's, it's a good one because even if people don't have the time for you, they still appreciate the call. And, um, and in those rare moments where people have been wanting to leave a piece of feedback or get in touch with something about it, you've actually sort of served their needs, you've attended to their needs before you even realized it was a need. So, I mean, it's, there's, it's very rare a moment where getting on the phone with a client, a member, um, uh, one of your attendees is, has, has a negative impact. It's just a matter of making it a priority and finding the time to do it and getting into the habit of doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, with respect, I know we're going to move on to a bit of goal setting. Um, and cause you've talked about you sort of like that, that log, um, long-term approach to membership and to belonging. Um, when you say goal setting, do you mean goal setting around just player development? Like what, what, what does that mean for you and your team? Well, goal setting, it, the, if, if I, if I was to look back, you know, the lessons I took when I was younger and very much like, you know, when I started was a, as a, a fresh coach, you know, the lesson or a lesson that I would give would often be, we're going to spend some time on your forehand and then do this and hit your backhand and do some serves and just kind of, you know, touch each part of the game. But over time that changed to be more, it's more about for me, I believe, trying to make a difference in the person's ability to, to, you know, reach their goals. And so it, it's really important that the member and the coach understand where they plan to go. And I'll, I'll give an example. There's a player I was working, uh, well, I'm, well, I'm working with, and we'll get back to working once, you know, once we're able to get on the court, but she's a pretty good player, you know, really needed to um, believe in herself more than anything else. 
So her goal was she wanted to start playing senior ITF tournaments. So we kind of looked at her game and said, okay, well, based on, you know, where you want to get to, here's what those players can do. And here's what you can do. And here's what we need to change. And so we started off and obviously there was some technical things we had to deal with. So we dealt with the technical things to make sure she was solid. Well, then, then there were some tactical things. And so the technical and the tactical have to sort of merge together to do it. But then those things were ready and then her performance wasn't where it needed to be. So then we had to address her mental state and her belief, you know, and then finally, while all that's happening, there were some physical goals. So we need to look at the whole player because the nice thing was we initially said it was going to be 18 months and, you know, close to 18 months, she made it to the finals of an ITF, you know, and ended up playing someone who coached her in the past and she, you know, she was thrilled. And this is, it's important because you, there's really no way to get somewhere if you aren't clear on where that somewhere is. So you have to do some goal setting to lay out the roadmap to take you where you need to be. And not everything is gonna be strictly dealing with players technique, which is very easy to do as a tennis coach. You know, you have to be able to have a sense of, you know, what are the, what is the totality of what this person needs to be able to perform and, you know, and function well. So that's kind of mm. what goal setting needs to be. Well, I think it's so important. You and I have had these conversations um, that the, the quite often, and we're probably transitioning to a moment of like what the lay of the land is with coaches and the industry in general. But um, quite often um, um, we know that skills are transferable um, and we know that coaches, generally speaking, have fairly decent approaches to goal setting um, across the four quadrants. Um, and we probably just want them to apply that to broader issues like customer service, like member retention, um, like um, engagement in programs or engagement in club activities, um, knowing that the base skill is there and it just needs to be, uh, it just needs to be painted across a, a, a wider, wider subject matter. Um, we're probably going to transition a little bit. I know when we were going through this in the first conversation, um, we kept coming back to, you know, what's life like out there in the real world. Um, you've had the luxury on some level of building your team over time and having a reasonable stability of that team. But you've also been in environments where you've had just people working for you for the summertime. Um, and customer service is a hot topic around um, you know, being a good tennis professional. Quite recently, I think um, I think Tennis Canada has uh, has uh, changed the pathway such that I think you have to go through the Club Pro Two, Club Professional Two course before you can get to the high performance stream. Um, can you comment on that a little bit? Like, what was the need for that change? Why the change? I, I, it's something I I very I think it's the right way to go. In the past, you know, you would start with your, you know, your entry level coach who's essentially, a, you know, a summer camp counselor, that would be a, a good description of what that person is trained to do. And then maybe you then decide that you want to be a full time coach. So you take, you know, your club pro one and that teaches you the nuts and bolts of, of you know, how do you, how, how do you become a coach who's going to work in the industry in a more full time basis. But then at that point, it used to be where you'd needed to stream and choose whether you were going to become a performance coach or a club coach. So you would, you know, go either to the coach two or the club pro two. And, you know, and, and some people have done both, but the thing is the feedback that was coming back was that the coach two is an excellent course for teaching people how to deal with, you know, developing young champion players. It was really, they were very good in that role, but what they lacked, well, not what they lacked was the ability to then run around Robin, manage an adult rec group, um, you know, those other skills. And the thing is, there's not that many people who have the only role of being a performance coach. Generally in a club, your role, you know, is broader than that. And so it was felt that if we could make, or not make, but have people develop more of those skills that related to the kind of the day-to-day -day business of working in a club that would allow for a more complete coach who could do both things. So 
Now you need to go through your Club Pro 2, which teaches you those. And some of the content from the Coach 2 has been moved over into the Club Pro 2 to kind of, you know, give people a good base so they have some of those high performance skills. But, but really, they, you know, they're a solid club coach. And then if they want to specialize, then they choose to go to high performance. And realistically, at least my belief is most, there's a bigger need for club coaches because most, that's most of the work that we do when we're on the court, you know, in a club environment. If you're in an academy, that's a different thing, but there aren't so many academies that are strictly academies. Those are kind of, you know, few and far between. Mostly there's an academy within a club and to be able to get enough hours, the coach needs to kind of do both things. So that's, mm. that's where that stands. Mm. I would probably think we don't probably need, I mean, the screen's been up for a few moments now. I don't think we probably need to go into um, all the topics on the screen, but it was probably more just to position it that, you know, we're not sort of like a, a dream pie in the sky that we have an understanding that, uh, the practical reality of the quality of customer service that any one tennis professional can deliver can vary. And all, all head coaches, all tennis directors deal with similar issues with getting their staff to raise the bar on customer service. Um, probably just transitioning now to where we are now and what you think, what do you think is important? Um, the uh, right now, you know, in, in my, for me, the, our people are feeling scattered and, you know, kind of alone. They, they don't have the ability as they did their, their, their social outlets have been taken away from them. Um, you know, they spend time if they're able to be working, they work and they go home and they go back to work. And there's no outlets and so their their sense of community is is very much diminished uh and so we need to do what we can to try to bridge the gap and and you know help people through the time we're in now but also see see towards you know when we can kind of get back to a a, a more maybe there's going to be a new normal but a more normal life and so as a tennis coach i believe that means you know i, I and you see it I, I think i think the people who understand this well are doing what they can um but understanding that it's not really about getting remunerated or getting paid for it but it, it's it's you know go out of your way to connect people you know maybe you're pointing people to i don't know to you know matches that they can watch or you're pointing people towards online resources or you're pointing people towards whatever it happens to be but we need to kind of you know do those things uh, aside from that then we need to be kind of ready to get back on the court and so you know we need to really be ready for what's coming because going back to it, it will very likely be some time before people will feel comfortable. You know, it's almost as though you can kind of imagine that scene in a movie where people come out from the bomb shelter and, you know, they come out and the sun is shining and they're, they're wiping, you know, wiping the sunlight from their eyes because, because they, you know, they've been inside for so long. So there's going to be some apprehension. Um, people are going to be unsure. And so we, we really need to be, be ready. So, you know, it, it's these things I feel that kind of that's, that's where we stand and that's what we have to be prepared for. Mm. Certainly, we have a lot of time at the moment to be having a not just a staged approach. You know, it, and we hear a lot of language around, you know, maybe casual court booking might be something we go back to sooner with two people or three, or we go back to private lesson environments where there's a limited number of people. So I think all around the world, we've seen different environments have this notion of a staged approach to return to play, but also, as you suggest here, having a few different models, a few different um, approaches to um, what the new normal might look like in a month or in three months or in six months, such that as things unfold in your own environment, you can adjust, you can adjust and, and prepare for it. Um, 
you spoke about reaching out and connecting with people. Um, um, and, and you've probably been particularly, uh, if we just probably flip down to the mental health part, so one more forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is uh, on some level you've referred to this before because, um, you, you know, you, I, although you're not living inside the club environment, you've taken a very personal approach to managing your members and to caring about their lives, their family lives. Um, uh, talk us through a little bit more about, you know, this notion of connecting people. Well, uh, you know, it, it, for me, it, it's again, because, because the, the people I work with, you know, are my friends and they matter to me. Um, the one I'll deal with is sort of actually the one that's listed last is, it's really important to me, like, you know, for the members that I know are, are because, you know, at a, at a, in a private club situation, a number of the members are a little bit older and some of them might be on their own and they're the vulnerable group. And, you know, if, if I know someone is living on their own, it's really important to me to reach out just to check in, to make sure, you know, see how they're doing, see how they're feeling, see, you know, are they feeling really isolated? they need to feel like they're not alone. And so, you know, to do that, then we maybe want to connect people virtually and, you know, and maybe it's just get a couple of people together and just have a quick chat, have like, you know, kind of like a, 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 a coffee call, you know, and, and just get together and sit down and chat as though, as though we were out for coffee, but we're at home, you know? And again, some, you know, a lot of the members are tech savvy, but some of them aren't so tech savvy. So just simple, simple things can, can really just mean a lot. And to know that somebody's out there concern for them it, it's helpful you know where needed yeah, no. you need to be you know able to then point people because right now i think everybody is keenly aware that you know in absence of their normal routine in the absence of their normal social supports we need to make sure that people's mental health is is you know is under control and so you need to be prepared to connect people to resources that could be out there or community-based resources just to make sure that, you know, they get the help they might need if someone, you know, mostly people are, are sort of managing, but, but that's important, you know? So we do these things and we try to get everyone together, get everyone through it because we, we got to look out to the other side of it. Yeah, no, I've seen a lot of approaches um, where people are using the, you know, the standard 4 p.m. lesson on a Friday that people would come to or the mid-morning ladies on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Um, connecting with the group at the time they normally would be coming out to an activity, uh, whether it's on, you know, a Zoom meeting or on a WhatsApp video call, using any of the platforms, house parties is big these days, you know, a virtual coffee. Um, and those things go a long way, not towards current revenue generation, but certainly toward a sense of belonging and community and the kind of leadership that we need to show um, probably reflects more on your next slide here about be just being a good citizen um, about just leaning into the responsibility that we have and that we have been given just based on our positions within the club within the community yeah i i, I couldn't agree more it's 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 sort of that old adage of, adage of treat people the way you'd like to be treated you know, and, and I, I, I see, you know, and, and I, I'll speak very personally. Um, you know, I'm watching more TV than ever. You know, I don't I generally watch much television, but, but, you know, I have time. And so sometimes I'm watching television and the things that I'm noticing, especially, and this is around the ad space, is the things that appeal to me are the companies and so on where, who recognize that it's not about what you can do for us, but it's about what we can do for you right now. You know, the ads where they just take the time to say, thank you. Thank you to those people who are still working to keep everybody going. And we need to have that mindset of, you know, of, of we're all in this together and, you know, we've got to, the only way we're going to get out of it is together. And so, you know, if there's a little thing you can do, that's going to help somebody else, you know, so for example, you know, your the local businesses are struggling. So once a week, you know, if you have the ability, you know, patronize a local restaurant, have them deliver, uh, you know, 
some sort of thing. Like, again, if you have the, but you maybe you don't have the ability because people aren't working. So it, it might be tough and you need to preserve assets, but, but if not, it's just, you know, understand your, how, how the, the web all fits together. We need help from others, but others need help from us. So that's, that's sort of, you know, how I see would be a good citizen. Absolutely. And we would, we would probably have members within our club environment as well that, you know, always donate to a fundraising event or are always helping out at a junior tournament or a senior tournament that they've either from their own business or from their personal, um, from their personal um, background have contributed to the success of our tennis programs and our tennis activities. And now is probably a good time to take stock of what that has been and to reach out and support them in those ways as well, you know, mm -hmm. fairly directly. Absolutely. Um, we've seen a lot of stuff, just probably transition here. We've seen a lot of stuff online about how, how coaches, how professionals are um, trying to derive not just continued activity, but perhaps some revenue um, with their current members, you know, continuing a lesson, but transitioning the topic or the delivery of whether that's, you know, to do with strength and conditioning or, or match charting. Um, do you have any favorites in here? Do you have anything that you've seen out there that you think is really connecting with people or that do you have any sense of that members are saying, I'd really love to keep doing this and I'm willing to do this and continue to pay for it? Um, for me, the, the thing, you know, I, in terms, in terms of revenue generation, I haven't seen too much personally, you know, cause I, I haven't chosen to take that approach, but the thing that, that I'm finding that people want more than anything is because they, they're, they're home. And then when you're home, you're not doing anything. And so people are looking for, you know, sort of that exercises like that sort of, you know, the, the, just things they can do, things they can do around their house by themselves. That's, that's what I've seen a lot of, um, you know, in terms of giving lessons and so on, you know, some people may have, you know, maybe some of my staff, I know they're, you know, they're choosing to do things in different ways. Um, they're possibly, you know, doing videos, little videos. I've seen a couple do little videos of, you know, some racket skills some keep ups, those sorts of things. Um, you know, I, I think it's really more a matter of finding what works for you and that you feel you can do and where you feel you can make a difference, but it's to remember that you can make a difference. And so, you know, any of the things that, that are posted uh, work really well. It's just, you know, find something, make it your own. And if you can generate revenue even better, that'd be great. Even better. Yeah, the two things I've seen of late, the, one of them is actually, um, you know, in the junior programming area, and it's just running a parent and child session online where you get on a Zoom call, um, the coach shows the activity, obviously both the parent and the child are watching the activity, but then the parent does the activity in their home, in the backyard, in the basement. Um, mm. And the coach is basically just leading the parent through that. It's a little bit of uh, co continuity and, uh, and probably a little skill development for the parents as well. I've seen that work really well. Um, and surprisingly, although it's never lost its fashion, you'll remember, uh, our former uh, uh, colleague, uh, Vlasta Bronkowski and the wall method, that check mm -hmm. method. I've yeah. seen so much of a return to um, wall type coaching and drill activities on the wall. Um, as long as you know, you're coming out of winter now, so you can actually access the outdoors. Yeah. Um, but we might see in this post COVID era, you know, uh, a whole bunch of garages and walls of the house that are just littered with tennis ball marks that might need to be painted, which wouldn't be such a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those things that the, the challenge, at least in, in the local area, in the Ontario area is, is uh, they're, they're trying to get people to, to stay in enough that they, you know, they're asking people to stay away from going to playgrounds and, and doing those things. So it, it's pretty quiet. Um, but yeah, but if, you know, if you've got, so I, I know, and here's again, a little anecdotal thing. With my older kids, I unfolded the mini net and we, we took the mini net out because we live on a court and we were playing, you know, and my daughter who hadn't played tennis in seven years was out there, you know, playing and she said, oh, I'll come out for a few minutes. Well, an hour, hour and 10 minutes later, you know, so people are itching to do things. It's just, we just kind of, we have to find a, do whatever we can to provide some sort of avenue and a venue to get 
people the ability to do it. And it, it's tough because because you really right now, at least in Ontario, need to stay only with your family or anyone mm -hmm. resident with you in your, you know, where you live. So so it, it's it's a little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. The lovely just a, a piece of tape or string across two chairs and a couple of lines and you've got a tennis court you can take it anywhere. So that's a good thing. Um, any thoughts about, you know, when, when we're back, um, what, um, what life's going to look like, uh, reflections, what's on your mind? The, uh, obviously the first and foremost one is, is, you know, we've got to do things to make people feel safe in the environment. Um, you know, people aren't going to come back if they're scared. And so, you know, and because we care about them, we want them to be safe, you know, we want our staff and our members first and foremost to be safe. So whatever it's going to take in the environment you're in, you know, I, I, it could be that, you know, as we said, as people have said, maybe we go back to, as you said, a staged approach where we kind of have fewer people on the court, people stay further apart. Um, you know, something that was mentioned to me was that, you know, maybe what you're doing is you're doing a lesson with a, with a can of balls or two cans of balls and, those balls go out once the lesson's over, you know, so there isn't really isn't picking up, but, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure what it's going to be, but, but the biggest thing is we're going to need to be prepared to, to make people feel like, you know what, it's going to be okay. That's the first thing. After that, what's, I think is going to happen is, is, you know, we're, we are going to end up in a new reality, you know, and so hopefully we're going to be able to get back to some of the things that people have comfort with, you know, um, but probably hope, and again, hopefully we'll find some things that work better. And so, you know, it's a matter of mixing the old and the new and coming into where we, you know, where we find ourselves today, but, but we, you know, we, we need, we need to really be ready so that when they, when they finally do say everyone can kind of emerge from your home, that we can get up and going. I, I think tennis is one of those sports that we can, we can pick up kind of quickly. Like, I don't think it's going to take a long time, but we need to be ready. Mm. I appreciate I appreciate those thoughts. I, I appreciate the time you put together on this, Andy, and uh, the discussions that we've had. Probably at this point, just uh, want to open it up to some questions from uh, those attending the webinar. And you can use the chat feature just to send through your questions to Andy. And while we wait for one or two questions, um, Andy, I probably had, uh, um, do, you, do you sense when we get back into the environment, we've been, um, in particular around junior programming, we've been so concerned about um, not having a lot of ball feeding and having kids play tennis, not just come to the lesson to learn tennis. Mm -hmm. um, do, you think, do you think this environment where we might just be using less balls to run a program or run a lesson might actually favor us, um, you know, having kids play as opposed to, or having adults play instead of just coming for drilling? I, I absolutely think so. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I, I really believe in that method. And so I'm fortunate that, that the members of my team have the same approach. And so we've always kind of been that way. And so getting the team, it won't, for me, take much of a change because that's kind of what we've, we've always done. But I absolutely, I think, I think that's one of the really nice things is, you know, you, you can have six kids on a court if they're in a rally situation. And they're all far apart. They don't need to be together. And, you know, one of the uh, a coach who I, I worked with and worked for in the past, I remember, you know, a couple of times him sending some kids to go play. And it's like, you have a one ball practice today. You get one ball. And, and you know, there's, there's times where that I've adopted this because it's, if you want to send that boring message, the, you know, the least sexy message we can send of being consistent, this is a great way to do it. Well, you know, this is an opportunity to be able to, you know, send some of these messages without having to kind of hit people over the head with them. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really see that, that getting back to more play-based things, that's one of the things that's going to make it much easier to, to kind of, you know, get back to where we need to be or not, well, get us back on the court where we need to be is what I meant to say. Absolutely. No, I absolutely would agree. And uh, our good friend Wayne Elderton on acecoach.com has all those great sort of situation-based, game-based methodology. So you really don't even need to be, um, I know lots of other federations and uh, countries have different approaches to player development and coach development, but uh, there are lots of great 
resources out there for you to, uh, to lean into um, that might, if you need to transition your coaching delivery or your coaching uh, methodology, that you can uh, quickly pick those tips up. Um, well, I think, I think we're, uh, I think we've covered everything, Andy. I really appreciate, uh, um, appreciate your time. I appreciate the, the thought you're giving. Um, we'll send a follow-up email with, uh, how people can find you if they want to connect with conversation and of course the cloud recording so that people can look at it in their own time. And, uh, and, uh, Ryan, Ryan says, thank you. <laughs> actually, I'm not sure if he's actually. I don't know if there's actually a question there. It's just popped up. Oh, here we go. Um, likely that we'll be returning with a stage approach. What ways can we satisfy the social events without bringing too many people together? That's the question from Ryan. That's, a, that's actually, it's, it's a great question. And, and I think, I think the, I guess the key is we just have to be prepared to run smaller, more intimate events. You know, uh, if, if depending on the, the situation, the, well, it, it probably depends on where things are, you know, often you're going to run an event and then you're going to have a social component after that the social component may have to kind of go by the wayside. You know, I'm not exactly sure. It probably depends on sort of the physical nature of the space that you're in. But I think just, you know, if you can run an event where you have four people to a court, some sort of, you know, doubles thing that people can do. I think, you know, that's going to allow people to, to get the feel of, you know, being together and, you know, playing, but without getting people, you know, too close together. Now, once the restrictions are on, on gatherings are lifted, then, you know, that may change a little bit. But I, I think at the very beginning, that's probably the form it's going to take. I think we're going to, you know, have to, you know, be satisfied if we run an event with eight or 12 players. That would, that would be, a, that'd be a great start, you know. If, if we have three courts across, then you can do 12 because everyone can see each other. They, you know, they get that feel like they're in an environment. If you have two courts side by side only, then you run for eight. Maybe run a series of events for four. You know, I'm not sure, uh, you know, but, but I, I, I see that being the way we, you know, we kind of go. Mm, I can see, I mean, just like when you go to a house party where it's BYOB, I could probably see the BYO sandwich, bring your own sandwich. <laughs> 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 uh, I think by the time we probably are getting back to that social environment setting as well, um, there will be some responsibility on us to maintain whatever level of distancing, physical distancing is required, certainly from as we are in charge of events that we deliver. But I also think that people will be quite used to being managed in that particular way. Um, it's not a behavior that we're going to have to uh, instill right from the beginning. Um, so I think people will help along. Um, and support each other and uh, and uh, we'll be just happy for the connection. Thanks Ryan for asking that one. Um, well, Andy, um, I know you've got an evening with the uh, kids and Kathy to get back to and uh, the sun, as most people can tell, the sun certainly gave me some challenges here this morning <laughs> based on the way it was coming up in the living room. Apologies for all the glare um, at different times. I appreciate Andy, you putting this together and staying with us this morning. And uh, again, the follow-up email will go out and you can connect with Andy and or myself at any point in time. Uh, just wishing everybody a good rest of the morning, good rest of the afternoon or evening. And thanks for joining.